that I just said is the Marine Hunter. Oh, there he's putting my linens there. I'll put it away later. And get the new soil again.
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Sons and your daughters, Lord, as a new to be taught to the world. Gather us with the joy of confession, give us to eat the bread that is good. Nourish us well and teach us to treasure, and let our good in the hearts that are Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant us, O Lord, to trust in you with all our hearts. For as you always resist the proud who can find in their own strength, so you never forsake those who make their boast of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Isaiah. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For waters shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know that he was there. Yet he could not escape notice, but a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a man who had been deaf and who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephpata, that is, be open. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, but the more he ordered it, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Good morning, Church of the Holy Comforter. Oh, man, this is loud, and I can't turn it down. Jan, can you turn it down, possibly? (laughs) Happy Labor Day weekend to everybody, and to everybody watching either right now or later on. I must admit that Labor Day for me is the beginning of my seasonal affective disorder. I can't help that I am a child of summer. I love the heat. I love the sun. I love long days, going outside, and the sun just instantly burns your skin. Can't be outside for more than five minutes, but hey, it's beautiful. So I'm a little upset that the days are getting shorter, colder, and we're already in September. And I'm also a little upset because this means that we're coming to an end of reading through Mark's gospel in our lectionary year B. We've been reading Mark all throughout this, and I've really appreciate the way that the lectionary has presented Mark to us. I think that the the verses that it chooses for each reading, the passages it pairs together, where it cuts it off and where it begins it, it's really good. And honestly, it's even better than the chapter divisions, which were put, put in long after Mark was written. And the lectionary does a good job of presenting the gospel. However, for all its strength, the lectionary has to end up getting interrupted two times a year for the great seasons of Christmas and Easter. And so what ends up happening, as you all know, is that each year we read about life, uh, Jesus' life and his ministry, his miracles, and his teachings during the seasons of Epiphany and Pentecost. So it gets a little interrupted talking about Jesus' life. The result being that for the past few weeks of reading Mark, we've been building up towards a climax that actually already happened back at the end of Epiphany on Transfiguration Sunday. But regardless, today's passage is a huge, pivotal moment for Mark. It's a turning point. Because Jesus has left the Galilee, and he doesn't leave the Galilee to go down to Jerusalem, to Judea, or even into Samaria. He leaves and goes north, outside of Judea completely, far north into the Roman province called Syria, modern-day Lebanon. And Jesus, hanging out a couple of big-sized towns there, wants to remain hidden. This is something that Mark has always in his gospel called the messianic secret. It's a huge theme of Mark's gospel that Jesus doesn't want to be known. He doesn't want people to know he's the Christ or has just performed a healing. He doesn't want anyone to know he's in town even. But every time in Mark, including this time, 
that messianic secret gets spoiled and Jesus is found out. And someone comes to him, a woman, and a Gentile woman, Syrophoenician woman. So this woman has no concept of Jesus' messianic divinity. She wasn't raised with Torah or with the Old Testament, as we call it, to expect that there would be someone coming anytime soon. But what she has heard of is his ability to heal, his victory over demonic forces in the Galilee that she's heard of. And so she comes to him and begs him to help her. And Jesus, surprisingly, refuses. This should make us a little uncomfortable that you have a woman begging Jesus to help her with her daughter that has a demon, and Jesus refuses. And not only does he refuse, but he insults her, and he calls her a dog, saying it is not fit to give the children's food to the dogs, the children being Israel, the dogs being the Greeks, the Gentiles, everyone else. In the Old Testament, dog is used a couple of times as an offensive term for Gentiles, their remark about their unclean nature or such. And so it should make us very uncomfortable that Jesus uses this uh, uh, to this woman and says this seemingly so heartlessly, so callously, as she's begging him. But then something even more miraculous and surprising happens. The woman talks back to Jesus. And not only does she talk back to Jesus, she actually proves him wrong using his own offensive uh, analogy. She says, yes, but even the dogs get the crumbs. Now, in Jesus' day, it was popular and still is in Jewish circles to debate scripture using, a, or even investigate scripture using a style called midrash. And this is wrestling with scripture, reading in between the lines, looking for loopholes, and maybe thinking a little more outside the box than our 21st century modern mind might allow us. And so that's what she does. She uses Jesus' metaphor and twists it back on him. And then Jesus tells her, very good, your faith has saved your daughter. So what is faith for Mark? Because she didn't come to even Mark's understanding of Jesus as the Christ. That's what he's building towards. That's the climax, by the way, when Peter acknowledges that he's the Christ and then the transfiguration. But this woman doesn't do that. Her faith is her own self-advocation, her self-affirmation, believing that she deserves that help from Jesus. It's not anything mental. It's not anything necessarily about theology or spirituality or a special prayer or special water. But it's about her loving herself and demanding that she be seen. And so Jesus knowingly or unknowingly, has allowed this woman to experience the Jewish way of knowing God, wrestling with God, being in conflict and tension with what we've been told. And in doing so, she opens up the door for all Gentiles because after that, Jesus leaves from this region of Tyre and Sidon and goes around into the Decapolis, not cutting back through Galilee, so he's still hanging out with Gentiles all the way around, now on the west side, east side, sorry, of the Galilee, and the Decapolis, the 10 cities, as it means. And this is the other major Gentile area that was around Judea. And the funny thing is, is that Jesus has actually already been here in the Decapolis, and things did not actually go over too well. This is the area, this is the scene where he cast out a legion of demons into a herd of pigs, and they all drowned in a river. Not a good look for the Jewish Messiah coming over and killing all the Gentiles' pigs. Definitely not a good look. So maybe this woman inspired Jesus to give the Gentile mission a second chance. And so he goes back to the Decapolis. And it goes much better this time. Because a man is brought to him, a man unable to speak, a man unable to hear, and Jesus heals him. And no buildings fall over in the background. Lightning doesn't strike nearby. It's just a good healing. And I love the way that Mark portrays Jesus' healing because he does it in such a way that even Matthew and Luke find a need to edit out because it makes us cringe a little bit. Even before COVID, Jesus spitting in people's mouths is just a little uncomfortable. But Mark keeps it in there. He keeps in Jesus touching his ears, spitting, touching his tongue, looking up to heaven and sighing, saying a magic word. That is a very interesting way to imagine Jesus healing people. And it's so physical. It's so human. 
He doesn't just think, and then a light beam comes down to this person's tongue and frees him. It's a human healing another human. And the symbolism of this man, unable to speak, unable to hear, is undoubtedly symbolic of the Gentiles as a whole who have been left out of this process of theology engaging with God. They have not been hearing the, gospel, or the law, the word of God. They have not been giving it back in their own speech. They haven't been partaking in the theological debate that is knowing God. But now they have. The healing has been done, and this community is open. And this episode of the healing the man ends in the same way that the episode of healing the woman began, with the messianic secret being foiled. Jesus says not to tell anybody, and the passage ends saying, but the more he told them, the more they proclaimed it. So is this what Jesus wants? We're left scratching our heads, and I'm pretty sure Mark is glad about that, wants us to wrestle with this, just as we've seen Jesus wants others to wrestle with him. Last week's passage was also a little bit of a weird passage to wrestle with. It was about clean and unclean food, proper ways to wash your hands, what comes into the body, what goes out of the body, blah, blah. But it comes right before this in Mark. And so we see Jesus has a debate within his own community about clean and unclean, in and out, right and wrong, how to do it technically correct. And maybe he had a realization and decided to go north into Syria and to go to the Gentiles. And then to go to the Decapolis to revisit that area that he'd already been. And the next passage in Mark, which unfortunately we won't read in the lectionary, is the feeding of the 4,000. And so Jesus ends his Gentile mission by doing the same thing that he did for the Jews in Galilee. He feeds them. He doesn't just welcome this new community. He doesn't just advocate for them in a little debate with the Pharisees and then double down by going into their region. He provides for them the same way that he provides for his own people. And so we should ask ourselves, what is this Jewish-Gentile debate that we see running throughout the New Testament? How can that apply to us today? The racial divide in America, talking about trans people, so many of our traditions and our rules and the way we do things have developed to make other people feel uncomfortable and to feel unwelcome. So I pray that we would be challenged by this Syrophoenician woman, be challenged by Jesus, who goes that extra step, who puts himself in there, put, makes himself vulnerable, and is willing to allow himself to be controversial in order to welcome people. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, we ask for the gift of your Holy Spirit, your Comforter, to help us turn toward you. Holy Comforter, hear our prayer. We pray for the grace and vision of your Spirit for those who are facing injustice and oppression, for those exhausted by the struggle with poverty and hunger. Holy Comforter, hear our prayer. We ask for the hope and comfort of your spirit for those whose lives are overshadowed by illness or pain. 
Holy Comforter. We pray for the peace and joy of your spirit for those living in the shadow of war and violence, for those afflicted by guilt and anxiety, and for those for whom the journey of faith has become hard and dry. Holy Comforter, we remember all those who have died, especially in Haiti, the central Gulf Coast, the eastern seaboard, Afghanistan, and all other strife-torn areas of the world. God of hope, we give thanks that not even death can separate us from your love. We pray for those whose lives are darkened by sorrow or bereavement, that they may feel your care for them. Holy Comforter, We ask for the guidance and strength of your spirit for those uncertain how to use their time, talents, and gifts, for those tempted to turn from you. Holy Comforter, hear our prayer. We ask for the presence of your spirit for those reaching out to comfort the distressed and for the leaders of all nations of the earth. Holy Comforter, hear our prayer. Loving God, we ask you for the assurance of your spirit to know your presence in our daily lives, in our relationships, in our work and service, in our worship, in our times of joy and pain. Holy Comforter, hear our prayer. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. God's grace be with all on this gorgeous day. We couldn't have picked a better day for our final outdoor service for the summer season. And welcome to all, especially those who might not have been able to join us for some time. Uh, there are, as always, uh, several announcements. I'll try to be brief. Uh, the first is a reminder that, as I said, this is our last outdoor service for this year. Next Sunday on the 12th, we begin our new schedule. Uh, new, not just for this fall, but new period. And that is, as I think everyone by now knows, we will celebrate the Eucharist at 8 and 10 o'clock, rather than 9, 11, 15. And formation for all ages will take place at 9 o'clock. So we'll have forum, chapel, church school, and so forth. Uh, so that's next Sunday. So please don't come at 9.15. Please don't come at 11.15. Please join us at 9 for the forum, uh, at which time we will... Um, uh, sort of do an overview and a welcome back of the year to come, as well as we'll start chapel and church school next Sunday. And speaking of that, this coming Friday, there is going to be a popsicle party for all students at 5 o'clock, I think, is it? 5 o'clock. 
uh, and it's a chance for the students to reconvene, to meet who their teachers are going to be. It's sort of a back-to-school night, if you will. It'll be right here in the church, 5 o'clock on Friday. So anybody with kids or anybody watching who is uh, planning to take part, uh, please join us Friday at 5 o'clock for the Popsicle Party. We're delighted that we're kicking off this new schedule next, uh, next Sunday morning. Also wanted to welcome back Beth Anderson. We didn't have room in the bulletin to put a thank you to her for playing because we had so many announcements, but thank you, Beth, once again for being here. I don't want to clap if I can. I also wanted to mention, uh, for those who knew her, uh, we've announced before that Julie Johnson, longtime member of the parish, uh, that her funeral will be this Friday. In fact, because of some family schedule changes, her funeral will not take place this Friday. It will instead take place on October 22nd. So if you're planning to come to Julie's funeral, please uh, know that it's been delayed by about uh, six weeks or so. I uh, also wanted to mention, we don't normally do this, we don't often have a chance to do this, but uh, we have somebody for whom this is their last Sunday at Holy Comforter. Uh, Tina is somewhere. Where, there's Tina. There you are. You moved. Um, well, for those who don't know, Tina is moving to Florida later this week. She is abandoning us. She is leaving us. No, that's not. Uh, Tina, as many of you know, has been on the vestry, has been deeply involved in Life Affairs, has led many adult fora, was our outreach coordinator for uh, several years, um, and very much a cornerstone part of our family here. So I uh, just want to send you forth with all of God's blessings and peace. We know you'll be back to visit, uh, but it... Yes, Florida's nice in the winter, right? <laughs> yes, but we will miss you and blessings to you and in this new chapter. I know there are other announcements I'm forgetting. Um, geez, what am I forgetting? Okay, anybody else have any? Oh, well, yes, Arden Frederick, uh, her funeral is going to take place as scheduled this coming Saturday at 2 o'clock. For those who knew Arden or know Earl, that will be here at 2 o'clock. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Honor and worship are indeed your due, our Lord and our God, through Jesus Christ, for you created all things. By your will they were created, and for your glory they have their being. In your loving purpose, you chose us before the foundation of the world to be your people. 
You gave your promises to Abraham and Sarah and bestowed your favor on the Virgin Mary. In your son, you suffered with us and for us, offering us the healing riches of salvation and calling us to freedom and holiness. Therefore, with people of every nation, tribe, and language, with the whole church on earth and in heaven, joyfully we give you thanks and sing. All glory and honor to you, God of grace, for you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, once for all on the cross to be the perfect offering for the brokenness of the world, that all who believe in him might have eternal life. The night before he died, our Lord Jesus gathered with his friends and took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took the cup, and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it to remember me. Therefore, Heavenly Father, in this sacrament of the suffering and death of your Son, we now celebrate the wonder of your grace as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Send your Holy Spirit that these gifts of bread and wine which we receive may be to us the body and blood of Christ, and that we, filled with the Spirit's grace and power, may be renewed for the service of your kingdom. Redeemer God, rich in mercy, infinite in goodness, we were far off until you brought us near, and our hands are empty until you fill them. As we eat this bread and drink this wine, through the power of your Holy Spirit, feed us with your heavenly food. Renew us in your service. Unite us in Christ and bring us to your everlasting kingdom. Blessing, Blessing honor, and glory be yours, here, here and everywhere, now and, and forever. forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. And now let us pray together the prayer for those of us worshiping with us virtually. My loving Lord, I believe that you are truly present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. I cherish you above all things and long for you in my soul. Since I cannot receive you in the sacrament of your body and blood, come spiritually into my heart. Cleanse and strengthen me with your grace. Lord Jesus, and let, and let me, me never, never be separated, separated from you. May I live in you and you in me, and in this life and in life to come. Amen. The gifts of God. May the people be blessed.
Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for restoring us in your image and nourishing us with the spiritual food and the sacrament of Christ's body and blood. Now send us forth a people forgiven, healed, renewed, that we may proclaim your love to the world and continue in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. Life is short. We have not much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be swift to love. Make haste to be kind. And point always towards the Savior. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth into the world, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God.